call to order the regular meeting of the Gurney Village Board of April 10, 2023. Roll call, please. Ross. Here. Garner. Here. O'Brien. Present. Thomas. Present. Thorstenson. Here. Woodside. Present. I'll stand with me for the Pledge of Allegiance. Welcome everybody. Just would like to open tonight just uh, on a somber note, unfortunately, um, for those that knew uh, Dan Robeson, uh, he passed away, was it Ginny was last week, is that right? Yeah. So Dan was uh, an architect in town. He was responsible for um, many of the buildings in town, including our own police department and other places. And I know that some of you or many of you have a personal relationship with him. Uh, and actually his wife Nancy had died just a couple years previous. So uh, my relationship with Dan, uh, he was on the plan commission, he worked hard in the village, uh, just had a good sense of humor, uh, liked working with him. He had Gurney at heart uh, and uh, just really sad to lose him, it was fast. Um, and I don't know, Jeannie, if you wanted to say anything or no? No, just a great guy. He was very involved in Exchange Club too and um, he, should be recognized. Yeah, I agree. I agree. He gave a lot to the village and uh, appreciated that. So, um, so we just move on to the approval of the consent agenda. So moved. Second. Uh, motion by Trustee Balmas, second by Trustee Garner. Roll call, please. Ross. Aye. Garner. Aye. O'Brien. Aye. Balmas. Aye. Thorstenson. Yes. Bye bye. Uh, Pat. Uh, number one. Approval. Approval of the minutes from the March 20th, 2023 and March 27th, 2023 meetings. At number two, approval of engineering division's recommendation to award the 2023 street maintenance and roadway reconstruction material testing services to Soil and Material Consultants, Inc. at a cost of $29,887. At number three, approval of request from Public Works Department to waive the formal bidding process and purchase floor epoxy and supplies from Armor Poxy at a cost of $31,292.75, Public Works Main Garage Floor Recoding Project. At number four, approval of request from Administration Department to dispose of certain administrative documents as authorized by the State of Illinois Local Records Commission. At number five, approval of issuing a raffle license and waiving the fee and bond requirement for the Exchange Club of Gurney. At number six, approval of payroll for period ending March 24th, 2023 in the amount of 940,000 $338.85. At number seven, approval of bills for the period ending April 10th, 2023, in the amount of $1,782,948.40. Motion to approve. So moved. Motion by Trustee okay. O'Brien, second by Trustee Garner. Roll call, please. <coughs> Ross. Aye. Garner. Aye. O'Brien. Aye. Balmas. Aye. Thorstenson. Yes. Bye bye. Motion carries. On to petitions and communications. Approval of proclamation designating April 9 through 15, 2023 as National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week in the Village of Gurney. Uh, so each year, the second full week of April is recognized as a National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week. This week is a chance for the village to celebrate the unsung heroes of the public safety emergency response, our dispatchers. The Gurney Public Safety Dispatchers are the first point of contact our residents have when calling in uh, an emergency, and they are the calm and reassuring voice at the other end of the phone. On top of that, our public service dispatchers are emergency medical dispatch certified, so they are able to provide step-by-step -step instructions on CPR, the Heimlich maneuver, and more to help start the life-saving process. Now, therefore, I, Thomas B. Hood, Mayor of the Village of Gurney, do hereby proclaim the week of April 9, through April 15, 2023, to be National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week in the Village of Gurney in honor of the men and women whose diligence and pro professionalism keep our village and our residents, businesses, and visitors safe. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Motion by Trustee O'Brien, second by Trustee Ross. All in favor say aye. 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 On to reports, Dr. Danny Wustman. Did I get that right on the end? I don't know. Almost. It was close. I'll take it, though. Now, is it 
is it legally Daniel or Danny? Everybody calls you Danny. Everybody calls me Danny. Please call me Danny. All right, so. I have to be formal. It's your gender. That's right. Uh, yeah. I got it. I got it. I didn't know if he was, like, legally Danny or not. So, like, <laughs> so we really appreciate you coming tonight. Yeah, Just our relationship me. with Warren Township High School is super important to us. Uh, a number of us have gone to Warren Township High School. It's been a couple years since I've been there. So I sure. uh, really appreciate all the work you do and uh, appreciate that you decided to come here. So this is the end of your first year, is that yes, right? Yes, correct. Okay, yeah. so um, you have the floor. All right, well, first off, I just want to thank uh, the village. Everybody's been super warm and welcoming as I, I came in here this last summer. I appreciate that. I do, just for the record, want to make sure everybody knows that we will uh, once again have a presence at the rib eating contest this year, and uh, maybe we'll have a different outcome uh, than we did this past year. Let's see. So um, while we're in Gurney, uh, sometimes it's good to remember that Warren Township High School covers about 50 square miles. Uh, right now, we're just above 3,500 students. So we cover all of or some of these uh, communities, Gurney, Beach Park, Gages Lake, Grandwood Park, Grays Lake, Milburn, Old Mill Creek, Park City, Third Lake, Wadsworth, Waukegan, and Wildwood. Uh, we are the high school district for three, we call them feeder elementary school districts or uh, other elementary community school districts here. Uh, Gurney 56, Woodland, actually that should be 50, sorry, and Milburn 24. All right, this is currently what I've uh, just got a couple stats to kind of go, just uh, do a general overview of uh, the high school district. Uh, so these are our enrollment numbers for the past five years. You'll notice uh, that we've been declining in enrollment. We had a peak uh, quite, uh, quite over 4,000 students, almost 4,500 students a handful of years ago, uh, and we've been declining uh, for the last handful of years. That's pretty normal right now in most school districts in Illinois. There's generally a decline uh, in student population. Um, it's probably a handful of issues. I tell people we just weren't having as many babies uh, that many years ago. Uh, sometimes people ask uh, how that compares to others. You know, generally as compared to other school districts, that's very similar. But I think here uh, in the village and in Lake County, there's been a pretty steady uh, population uh, rate. So we're seeing that decline in enrollment despite a fairly uh, even population uh, here uh, locally, but also in the county. Um, we do, uh, on a regular basis, have enrollment projections. Uh, these, can, these are fairly accurate usually in an upcoming five years, and then after five years, we continue those projections on a regular basis, but uh, it's harder to predict uh, more than five years out. So usually you'll see something pretty steady after the fifth year. In a high school district, it's fairly easy for the next five to seven years to predict enrollment because we have elementary schools that feed into the high school district. Uh, and so this is what our enrollment's gonna look like most likely over the next five years. There's obviously some possible variability there, uh, but you'll see that uh, we will continue to have declining enrollment most likely through at least 2028. Uh, then in 2028, it really uh, levels off and is probably right now we're looking at it's going to be pretty level for a handful of years. As I said, it's get, it gets a little bit harder the further out you go, but because we uh, have elementary school districts, we can see those students, those young ones, as soon as they hit kindergarten, uh, we're able to be uh, more than not confident. Um, so this will put us below 3,000 students most likely in the year 2028. Uh, and that will carry with it some different types of conversations that we haven't had to have in the community for a long time. For many, many years, the conversation was always about big, grow, uh, increase in enrollment, where we're gonna put all these kiddos. Um, and so we'll probably in the next three to four years have to have different types of conversations. Um, the high school continues to have uh, some really, I think, uh, good data that the community should be proud of. Uh, we have a 93% graduation rate compared to an 87% graduation rate at the state level. Our 12-month uh, college enrollment is at 85%. That means 85% of graduating seniors enter or enroll in a college, university, or trade school within 12 months after graduating from high school. That's compared to 75% at the state level. And then uh, the students that are experiencing an, or having an early college experience uh, at the high school and at any given year is 33% compared to a state average of 32%. So we're right around there at the state average uh, here with early college experiences. Early college experiences for a high school student mean either an advanced placement course, many of us are probably familiar with that maybe, 
from our own high school experience or our own children's high school experience. That's taking a course that's considered to be higher level and then there's a national test they can take, uh, much like an SAT test, uh, but specific to that subject area. And then many colleges or universities will give them some credit for that class. And so um, maybe if you're really good at math, um, you take an AP math class, you might get a high enough grade that uh, maybe you don't have to take those introductory math classes in college and you can jump to a level, you know, maybe a level 200 class uh, for math in college. Uh, that's really beneficial for students. Uh, early college experiences also include dual credit opportunities. And so most of those are done through uh, the community college here in the county um, uh, and, and partnership with the tech campus. So we have a lot of students that go to the tech campus Warren Township High School is the largest provider of students to the tech campus. A lot of that is because of proximity and because of our size. We have about a little over 300 students that attend the tech campus every day. We have about uh, three different groups of students. So a whole bunch of students will congregate after uh, the morning starts. They'll go to their first period, then they'll congregate, uh, and they'll jump on a bus and go over to tech campus, and we do three rounds of those at any given time uh, or on uh, during the day. Let's see. Our attendance rate, um, this is an interesting statistic. I like to show this uh, recently only because this is the best way that I can describe the impact that we've got on COVID with, with hard data. So traditionally, Warren Township High School has had pre pretty consistent graduation rates. Um, let's see, they've been uh, steady with uh, the state. You know, we're around 95, 94, maybe 96% on any given year. And then COVID hit. And what you see across the state is that uh, attendance went down uh, the year after COVID. The year that, that year 2020, the 2019-2020 school year, when we started school, nobody know, knew what COVID was, and then halfway through the year, everything kind of blew up. There was some really pretty lax attendance requirements. So if we just kind of ignore that year, you'll see that between 2019 and 2021, uh, we had a pretty, for us, that's a significant attendance drop. That would be a significant attendance drop for any school district, uh, four or 5% attendance, excuse me, drop and we're a little bit better this year at 92 percent but still uh, sometimes it takes school districts years to go up one or two percent and there's a lot of work that goes behind that um, i think that this is um, our impression is that this is one of the byproducts of, of the pandemic is that students for multiple years weren't in school every day uh, some of them unlearned how to do school or forgot how to do school or some of them never had a high school experience until uh, a, a, what we would call a normal high school experience until uh, maybe their sophomore or their junior year of high school. So this has been a really tough transition for many of them. Um, and I think this number uh, really is kind of a, a background number to lots of conversations around things like teen anxiety, uh, depression, um, uh, inability to act appropriately in social situations. There's just a lot of some of these soft skills that uh, we learn when we are in seventh and eighth grade and um, having that middle school, school experience as a, a young adolescent that many of our students didn't get what we would consider normal experience with. And so it's been a little bit tough for them to get back into the swing of things. It's been tough for our schools to get back into the swing of things. Um, and that's the statistic that I like to show to just describe something with hard data that is kind of in a way to show what a lot of us know kind of happened or people are talking about, but sometimes it's hard to put your finger on. Let's see, I, I want to spend a couple minutes and talk about the referendum. The referendum passed just a couple days before um, I uh, officially stepped into the job. Um, and so uh, it's been a big part of my experience here in Warren. And regardless of which side individuals and the community sat uh, on the question, um, I do believe that we are, are able to provide some increased services to students pretty sig in a pretty sig significant way. So I just want to talk about that. That's having a a large impact on our schools already. So it's a 60 cent increase to the district's tax rate, uh, which is about $17 per, per month for a $100,000 home. Uh, right now the average home in Gurney I looked up is, is selling for around $300,000. So that's about $50 a month for the average Gurney home. It's not an insignificant amount of money for many of our families and we're appreciative of the trust that the community gave us uh, in the passing of that referendum. The school district and the school board before I came uh, to Warren made what I would lump in three categories, commitments uh, to the community. The first was to preserve the eight period day. The second was to restore and protect 
activities, clubs, and athletics. Sometimes we separated this out and talked about restoring and protecting activities and clubs and then restoring and protecting athletics. And the third commitment was uh, to improve academic supports and mental health services. And sometimes, depending on the conversation, we would split that up into two different categories. These are really, really important parts of a school district and part, uh, really, really important parts of any school, if you think about it. So an eight period day um, for us at the high school, what that means is that we're able to continue to offer um, some of our, what we would call um, extra classes or the elective classes or the fun classes. Um, I, have, uh, I have a son that's in 10th grade right now. I live in Cary uh, and super smart kid. Um, gets really good grades and the class that he loves to come home and talk about every day is his culinary, his foods class. Um, and without an eight period day, we wouldn't be able to offer that type of experience uh, for my son and for many of the students. Uh, the eight period day would, uh, getting rid of the eight period day would have meant that we were not, would not be partnering with the tech campus uh, for students to travel off uh, campus and go to some of those career and technical education classes. So this is a really big part of, of our students day when we think about uh, foods classes, art classes, uh, home ec classes, technology classes, uh, and some of those career preparatory classes. Uh, but luckily, uh, because that passed, uh, I'm not in a situation where I'm having to confirm uh, with families that indeed next year we, will, we would only be offering seven classes. And I, I will tell you that those, those plans were created, they're in play. Um, and happily, when I stepped in, we were able to say, okay, actually, we don't need to move forward with this. It's a big deal for our students. A second commitment was to restore and protect activities, clubs, and athletics. Uh, that first week that I was in uh, the office, we did repost uh, positions for uh, club advisors and coaches that had uh, previously, those individuals had been told they did not, were not going to uh, participate in those activities. They weren't going to oversee those activities for what would have been this current year, but we reinstated all those and were able to hire those individuals back, uh, including um, some management positions to oversee uh, those clubs, activities, and athletics. And then that third commitment to improve academic support and mental health services uh, continues to be a really, a, big, a really big and important part of our work moving forward. Uh, in the last few months, as we get, start gearing up for this upcoming school year, we've been able to post uh, two teaching, just general two teaching positions, uh, four uh, teaching positions that are specifically targeted towards English language learners, which is a high need uh, uh, group and, and subgroup population of our school district, as well as two psychologist positions. We are uh, also planning on uh, continuing to post some other positions here in the coming weeks as we continue to get feedback from our staff on the real specific ways that we can provide student supports. Uh, and mental health services. Uh, so in a school district where uh, for six or seven years, the school district had been uh, reducing staff, reducing services to students, it's been a, what, what seems like and what people are telling me is a fresh, a breath of fresh air to be able to say, oh, next year we're actually going to be adding six, seven, eight, 11, 10 uh, individuals uh, to provide direct student services, uh, especially for those for uh, our neediest students. So I'm just going to walk through these uh, again as uh, to just talk about what that means. So an eight period day means uh, students, for example, can take welding classes at the tech campus. It means uh, that students can take AP classes uh, that they wouldn't normally have been able to take. And students might be able to take an art class that we wouldn't have been able to offer. Um, let's see. Restoring and protecting activities, clubs, and athletics includes things like our bands and orchestras, um, our feeder teams for our sports, our freshman and JV teams, as well as some of our clubs uh, and uh, activity groups. This is, I believe, a, um, let's see, a, a, a future business leaders of America group uh, on a field trip they went on this year. Uh, speaking of, uh, we did have, just so I wanted to squeeze this in here, some, I don't have the students here with me today, but we did have some state recognitions uh, this year, last, uh, this last season. Amanda Hammond was a state champion uh, gymnast in the vault. Aaron Stewart, who's just a freshman, Amanda's a senior. Aaron Stewart is a freshman and placed third place at the state uh, competition for wrestling in his weight class. And then Mark Mangren uh, was the state champion. Some people might not know there are things like this. I think this is super cool in 
uh, Microsoft Alpha's PowerPoint. So he gets to go down to the national competition in Florida uh, here coming up. Fun, fun things that I was never able to do uh, in high school. Let's see, I'm gonna jump to the third one here, which is to improve academic supports and mental health services. This allows us to make sure that we're increasing staff that would meet with students one-on-one. -on -one. It also allows us to increase staff uh, in a way that will provide more opportunities for group proactive uh, supports for students. Um, and then allows us to uh, continue to offer or expand or bring back some of our academic support, such as uh, resource rooms or study halls uh, for students. I just want to also take a few minutes and talk about what the referendum means big picture for our school board uh, and for their vision for the future. So as soon as I came into the school district, like I said, that referendum had passed just a couple of days before I stepped into the office and um, or into the school district and pretty quickly uh, my board uh, gave me the directive to, to relook at our long term planning uh, to make sure that what was in there was aligned with what we had promised the community for the referendum. Um, and so they said they also wanted to do that in a way that was a little bit different than we had done it in the past. And instead of running, you know, um, uh, getting a group of stakeholders together, maybe 40 or 50 people to meet four or five times, they wanted to see what they could do to involve uh, students more specifically in our long term planning process. So, um, I had, uh, I brought together a group of four student leaders, one from each grade level. Some of you might know Yash. Yash was one of our student leaders. He was our senior representative. Yash seems to be all over Gurn the Gurney area. Um, so I had a senior, a junior, a sophomore, and a freshman, and they helped me put together a cadre of 25 other student leaders. And in December, those 25 student leaders and I met and I trained them in a small group facilitation. Um, how to lead a small group of people in a conversation uh, that allowed everybody in the room to have some voice, to give some feedback. And during the months of January and February, those 25 student leaders without me or other adults uh, in the room led over 20 small group visioning sessions with their peers. So I got some pictures up here of what, what that kind of looked like. It happened in multiple, uh, over multiple days and in multiple different environments. On the bottom left, I think that's Yash actually in, in the pink sweatshirt with the blue hat. Yash is on a Wednesday morning leading a vision session with a group of 20 peers in our library uh, at Almond. On the top right, uh, this is Addie, you'll see. She's leading a small group conversation here at Old Plain. She's a sophomore uh, with a group of freshmen and sophomores. And then on the bottom right, I forget who was leading this one, but that's uh, in a classroom. So. Uh, during the day, uh, it was in a, a classroom uh, where students were already at. The bottom left and the top right pictures are before or after school opportunities that students had to stick around um, or come early. And then sometimes we ran sessions during the day because not all, all of our students are able to come uh, before school and after school. We called these visioning sessions and we were able to involve over 400 students in these visioning sessions. And we ended up with four different areas that our students said, we want to focus on. Those were diversity, equity, and inclusion, social, emotional well-being, academic excellence, and continuous improvement. And so some of the, just briefly, some of the areas that we'll be focusing on here in the, in the coming years because of uh, what our students told us they really wanted to make sure we focused on in ways that would be supportive to them are additional staffing. I already uh, discussed that a little bit. Um, a lot of that staffing has specifically to do with our social emotional needs and making sure students have the right support services that we can wrap around them. Uh, the second one there is uh, restorative and trauma informed practices. This is a recognition that um, when I went to high school and even when I first became a high school administrator, a lot of the repercussions for poor decisions were you just got kicked out of school for a couple days. And that's not serving our students, especially our most needy students uh, as well as we should be. And so trying to figure out a way to restore uh, relationships uh, between students and between students and staff uh, instead of just sending them home and then expecting them to act differently when they come to school is what we would call restorative practices. Trauma-informed practices really have to do with how a staff member, either maybe a teacher, a support staff member in the hallway or in a classroom, or maybe someone in student services like a social worker or a school counselor, how they're interacting with students, recognizing that that student may have grown up in a household that's different than the household that I grew up in. 
uh, and their experiences the day before, or the night before, or the year or two before uh, might just be different, and that impacts their outlook, their understanding of repercussions, the un their understanding of the decisions that they make. Uh, community resources, our students talked a lot about um, needing help connecting with community resources uh, and understanding how to use and utilize community resources. Some of that has to do with their social emotional needs, but some of that also has to do with they have a really high interest in uh, career preparation. I was surprised by this. As an adult, I always knew and thought that I had to force down students uh, how important it was to prepare for their career. But when you get a group of students together in a small group of 20 people, they really quickly let you know that they're really worried about their career preparation. And they it's really important to them. They're scared of what they don't know. They know they don't know a lot. And when they're not trying to impress their friends, this is on their minds. Um, the idea of alternative schedules came up. Um, you know, an idea of maybe bringing back uh, what, what we would call a homeroom uh, to the high school experience, maybe not every day, but some days, uh, so that they have a place that's not an academic reading, writing, arithmetic type class to learn um, some of these things. How do I connect to community resources, for example? They thought that might be a good way to build relationships and better understand how the world works. Um, Number five is something that um, I think was a really loud part of what our students told us. They said they would like to be more involved with the decisions that we make at the high school. And being a high school, I think we can do that, and we're going to try to do that. They were a really great example in running these focus groups. It was really amazing to watch them lead their peers and come up with really important, realistic um, ideas that... I think we can implement and align actually really well with our school board's uh, priorities and our staff priorities. So we're going to work on uh, giving them a couple seats at our board meetings, uh, making sure that on our improvement teams, we have some leadership team meetings that they're coming to our meetings at least monthly. We have representatives from our students to help us understand not only what our current students feel like we need to be focusing on, but also alumni. And so we've got a couple alumni that said that they would be able to, uh, willing to help us. And the last thing I want to touch on here before I open up for questions uh, and continue to bore you too much, is career pathways. Like I said, our students are really interested in career pathways, want to be able to give back to their communities, uh, and want to know how do, how do we make those two things uh, work together. So uh, the way that we are looking at career pathways and at Warren uh, models uh, a st the state framework for uh, what's called a career pathway endorsement. And this endorsement really involves a, all students or a student um, making a plan their freshman year that includes three things. A plan to how to succeed with traditional academics. So this would be probably your or my uh, expected high school experience. You know, I need X amount of credits in English, X amount of credits in math, X amount of science credits. I need all these credits to graduate. So I'd call that traditional academics. But then in addition to that, um, they, need a, they would put together a plan that includes a sequence of career courses. So this is, in most cases, a series of three uh, career-based courses that happen in sequence. So um, that are aligned to a really specific career interest area. Uh, so maybe I'm, I'm interested in healthcare or something. I might take a series of courses that allow me to first be introduced to the healthcare field, and then second and third for that second and third class, or maybe fourth class too, maybe I'm starting down um, a pathway to become an EMT or uh, a CNA. Um, I, have some type, and I have some type of experience that the school district has available for me uh, that allows me to go through those steps and graduate from high school, not just with a high school diploma, but maybe a certification. Um, this is available at our tech campus and many uh, career interest areas but not at our high school. So if we have a student that wants to stay at the high school and have the regular high school experience, but that's not currently available, and we would like to make a, a career sequence available for all of our students. And maybe some of the more specialized uh, career interest areas still have that experience at the tech campus, uh, but not all of them. And then the third part of that individual plan for career pathway would include what we call workforce experience. This might be an internship or some type of job shadowing. Uh, so the state of Illinois has a framework for that that allows students to graduate and uh, maybe with a finance uh, endorsement or a health care endorsement. Um, and 
we, for the last five years, really at Warren haven't prioritized that uh, type of work. But it's something really important that our students are asking us that we're planning on prioritizing moving forward. So that's kind of an overview of where we're at in the school district. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, if there are any. We'll look to my right. Is there Trustee O'Brien? Thank you for the presentation. Love how much you're getting the students involved. Appreciate it. It's way more than I had. Um, my real question, though, is if, if the population is going to decline, and you, you mentioned you have some hard decisions coming up, mm -hmm. you have one or two ideas of what those might be? Sure. So um, the conversations we'll probably have to have if the population declines like uh, the projections um, uh, references, how do we how do we balance our two school, our two campus model? And maybe there's a different way to balance that model, um, as well as maybe there's a different way that we should do some of our tech campus um, partnerships. So right now with about 300 students every day being uh, bussed over to tech campus, that's a lot of students that we could keep indoor, in our doors. Um, and if there's some opening of space within our schools, maybe we could use those spaces a little bit more creatively and have some of those career preparation uh, experiences in our spaces. For example, um, if you're interested in, let's say, auto mechanics, uh, we don't have a place at Warren space-wise. We've never had the ability to have a place like that at Warren. So students that are interested in auto mechanics have gone to the tech campus to have that experience. Maybe we can have that experience uh, in-house. Um, so I think it's going to be a combination of do we continue to have a split campus that with uh, our a split school campuses uh, where one of the campuses serves 9th and 10th grade and the other serves 11th and 12th grade, or do we need to rethink that? Will we want to rethink that in the future? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else to my right? No? To my left? I had a question. How are we handling uh, behavioral issues with, with uh, high schoolers, you know, kids? Boys will be boys, as they say, yeah. and they start fighting each other and things like that. How is that handled? I mean, within, the, you know, my kids graduated Warren. I have four of them go through the system, and they, they did just well. So I, I'm all about Warren. But um, mm -hmm. um, recently, I had a mom call me, and several of her, uh, her, her, her son and several other kids, they were uh, expelled. And according to her, it was a situation where, you know, the first time offense for her son and she didn't understand, yeah. you know, an expulsion on a first time offense, nobody was hurt, that kind of thing. Um, and so, you know, and you, you know, you hear about zero tolerance policy. Where, are, where is Warren uh, in a situation like that? Yeah, great question. Um, so, there, well, there's probably a couple questions there, so I'll try to answer them or comment on them, and then I'll come back to you, and, and you can follow up if I didn't uh, touch on any of those, or if you'd like to, me to go into those deeper. Um, let's see. Discipline and student behavior has been something that's been uh, tough for Warren Township High School probably over the last five or six years. Uh, some of that is related to some new state laws uh, that prohibit school districts, all school districts in the state of Illinois, for sending students home, or what we would call suspension, uh, where they don't receive services in the school um, for things that are uh, any for things that are not considered a safety threat or hazard. So in the past, um, at least when I was a school administrator at a different high school, if a student skipped enough school, we would suspend them. And as an, as an example of, um, of something um, and I think some of the reasoning behind that is that um, lawmakers feel like the schools are better equipped uh, to support students if they're in the school, and uh, sending them home is not, uh, is not changing behavior or changing decisions. So you, we have seen uh, different types of struggles over the last five or six years in discipline because students, um, if they make a poor decision, if they might be uh, inconsiderate to staff or insubordinate to staff or rude to staff, for example, or inconsiderate to each other, rude to each other, and then they're not suspended unless there was an actual safety threat. So we have seen an increase um, in the frustration level uh, internally around student behavior. Uh, I think some of that's because staff members don't see a repercussion. A lot of the uh, misbehaviors for students now are um, mediated or addressed with what we call conferencing. Uh, so a student might meet with an adult. Uh, that might be a dean of students or an assistant principal 
might be a social worker or school counselor to process that and try to think through uh, the results of their behavior. They might meet with the student where there was a conflict and we'd have what we would call a restorative conversation where they try to restore the relationship. Uh, but in most cases, unless there's a safety threat, the student is not uh, sent home for misbehavior. Um, we have had a handful of fights this year uh, that were pretty high profile. Fights these days uh, are easily high profile because our students uh, put them on the internet uh, and despite rules around that you can't record other people in the school without their consent, that's one of our school rules, um, they do it anyway. Um, so as soon as there's a fight or if they know that there's a fight, um, oftentimes students are either ready to record that or they'll be real quick on recording that. And um, in many ways that makes the feeling of uh, the fights it, it, in the community, it feels like there are more fights than maybe there were 10 or 15 or even five or three years ago because they're seeing them more that because it, um, they're on the social media. When um, a student um, makes a, a decision that um, may impact the ability of the school administration to run the school in a safe way, a predictable way, then that student is recommended for uh, consideration for expulsion to a school board. Um, we have unfortunately uh, gone through that process uh, probably a dozen times this year, all related to just a handful of incidents uh, that were fights uh, in the school. Generally, when a school board is looking at a fight, they're considering things like, uh, they will consider whether or not a student had uh, multiple issues around this. They'll consider whether the student had any type of intervention beforehand. So maybe before the fight, if an adult, uh, a dean, a social worker, a counselor, uh, recognized that there was some tension building up, they might have met with a student or a group of students to say, hey, we need to calm down. Um, let's talk through this issue. Are there ways that we can address this? Um, let's see. The school board will so the school board will consider some of those types of interventions. Uh, the school board will consider uh, what the involvement uh, was between the student and any staff members. So if a student uh, has a, an altercation with another student, we would consider that egregious. But if a student has an altercation and uh, because of that altercation, a staff member who maybe is trying to break them up or telling them to disengage, uh, that staff member is is accosted or hurt, um, then that would raise the heightened uh, uh, consideration by the school board. Um, the decisions that the school board are making really have to do with uh, if the, whether or not the they believe the continued presence of the student poses a possible risk uh, to school individuals in the future. And oftentimes, um, in the most egregious situations, if a student has uh, shown that they weren't able to disengage from action uh, after being repeatedly told by an adult, or if a student um, was um, emotional enough in the moment to harm an adult, uh, then that, um, that's a serious consideration by the school board. Uh, the school board um, doesn't necessarily um, take expulsion off the table as a possibility if the stu if it's the first time offense. Whether really they're looking at that offense and saying, um, does this offense give us uh, the impression that the uh, continued presence of that child poses a threat uh, to the school or to the continued regular operation of the school? That's my attempt to answer your question or comment on it. What else? What other information can uh, I? Give no, you? that's good. You know, it. it um, that's a question that's dear to my heart because I was that kid who who made a few mistakes in school. And, and, you know, I was fortunate in that because I kept my grades up. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to get expelled, you know. Yeah. It gave me a chance. But, um, you know, it's a particular mom that had called me and, and yeah. asked me about it. And I, I didn't know what the policy was at Warren because my kids didn't have any issues. Sure. Um, but I just wanted to say, to, to you, and it sounds like you, you do a very good job with, with the groups, getting the kids together, the groups, and, and trying to uh, uh, make lemonade out of lemons, if you will, in difficult situations. Um, but it, when we expel kids from school, because years ago there was another kid this happened to, and I went to his defense, and, and uh, 
and it, it got worked out. But you can ruin a kid, and I'm sure you're aware of that. I mean, you can ruin their school experience, and I think we have to remember these are our kids. Mm. They're going to make mistakes, mm. and we must do everything we can do to make sure that one mistake won't ruin a kid for life. I mean, because you, it, it can make them angry. It can make them just, just hate school altogether. And as I said, I was that kid, and, and it did that to me, but there were people in my life who came uh, at the right time, and it caused me to put all that behind me and move forward. So that's why I asked. Yeah. No, I, I appreciate that, and I agree with what you're saying. Um, expelling a kid, is, a student from school is a big decision. It has a lot of impact on, on the child and the child's family oftentimes. Um, our school board has a commitment to, and they, they have done this this year, and I believe they've done this in the past years, uh, but our school board's tradition, pattern, and their commitment is that they pay the tuition for any student that's expelled from Warren Township High School at an alternative school that uh, is in the county run by the Regional Office of Education uh, to try to make sure that we don't have a gap in education uh, for those students. Uh, so they do have a commitment to try to make sure that education continues. Um, yeah, yeah, I appreciate the comments. Right, thanks for the answer. Yeah. Else? Thanks, Danny. I appreciate it. Thank I always you very feel much. like taking Warren on the road. I always, there's so much that we don't know. It always seems like unless you have a kid in school, you just don't know what's going on. And yeah. I just appreciate you laying it all out for us. So no problem. thanks for the time. Yeah, thank you very much for uh, having me tonight. Again, thank you to some of uh, the leaders. They've been very supportive uh, here, uh, not only for me, but for the school district and everybody uh, has continued to tell me that the village is a friend of Warren Township High School. We appreciate that, that partnership. And I am going to go jump over because there's some things going on across the street, if that's okay. All right. To him. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks, Tim. All right. Uh, no old business, right? Correct. Uh, so on the new business, approval of ordinance 2023. 23. Approving the annual budget of the village of Gurney, County of Lake, State of Illinois, for the fiscal year beginning May 1st, 2023, and ending April 30th, 2024. Pat. Sure. So this was a topic of our public hearing. Uh, budget process started back in December. Been before the village board multiple times. Uh, Ninety-three million dollar budget. General funds balanced. Uh, no new debt. Lowest debt burden of any community over twenty-five thousand in the state. No new taxes in the budget. Uh, four and a quarter uh, new positions to assist with succession planning. Um, Seventeen point eight million dollar capital program. Second largest capital program in the village's history. Uh, are some of the highlights. So uh, no property tax, continue on with no property tax. That's been going on for over 20 years. So solid budget. Uh, it's a lot of infrastructure improvements um, that need to occur, um, taken care of. Um, and again, um, continue with strong succession planning. Uh, a lot of the items that departments included uh, also relate to the strategic plan that we recently completed. So that plan has been laid forth and the departments are using that. Um, so it's solid document. Again, um, talked about it multiple times in public, um, and it's ready for consideration. Thank you. Is there any uh, comments or questions to my right? To my left, is there a motion? So moved. moved. Second. Uh, motion by Trustee O'Brien, second by Trustee Balmas. Roll call, please. Ross. Aye. Garner. Aye. O'Brien. Aye. Balmas. Aye. Thorstenson. Yes. Bye-bye. Motion carries. Just want to say that I really want to thank staff for their hard work. Uh, this starts long ago and putting this all together, uh, the hard work especially of uh, Brian and Pat and each of the department heads for doing all that they have. I know that you spend a lot of time uh, going through this and thinking about it and also with the trustees with their hard work uh, and considering the uh, budget itself. Uh, Again, it's a success. It's a balanced budget with uh, we've just done really well over the last any number of years. So I uh, just appreciate that. And also thank you to our businesses as well that contribute to our ability to be able to have a balanced budget. So thanks. So item item number two, approval of ordinance 2023. 24. Amending chapter 32, article 2, section 38 of the Gurney Municipal Code pertaining to the comprehensive fee schedule. Pat? Sure. So annually we update section nine of the budget, which is our fee schedule, uh, provides an easy to understand format of all the villages, taxes and fees in that section um, in accordance with the uh, budget approval process. 
We also amend chapter 32 if there's any fees that have changed. Uh, chapter 32, the municipal code holds a comprehensive fee schedule. Uh, this year, the only changes to the fee schedule uh, mainly uh, hover around water and sewer. So as we talked about throughout the budget process, a three and a half percent um, increase in the water rate, despite where inflation's at. Uh, we included the uh, senior discount program in there as well. Uh, sewer rates and uh, water and sewer, sewer service charges will also increase by three and a half percent. And then uh, the Public Works has a uh, rate for tankers when they fill up at Public Works bulk water. Uh, we're proposing uh, to add 21 cents to the current water rate to reflect uh, just the administrative costs uh, that relate to managing that process. So those are the only changes. All of the other uh, rates, fees, taxes uh, remain status quo. Is there a motion? So move. Second. Motion by Trustee Garner, second by Trustee Thorsonson. Uh, roll call, please. Ross. Aye. Garner. Aye. O'Brien. Aye. Balmas. Aye. Thorsonson. Yes. Bye-bye. Motion carries. Uh, out of that, I just really, again, want to highlight the uh, senior discount for water rate. It's really the village's commitment to try to make it easier for our seniors, recognizing that they're living on fixed incomes and that we don't want to be, as best we can, be part of the process that um, once oppress seems like a hard word. But um, and nonetheless, it's uh, when you have um, inflation like we've had this past year, it's very difficult for them to make it. And from the village's side, we're going to do our very best to see that, especially for seniors, that they don't uh, have to pay more. And actually for the rest of the residents that uh, in terms of uh, doing our best to um, keep our costs down and uh, encourage revenues up, uh, just like anybody's good budget, that we'll do the same thing uh, so that our residents uh, are able to live in the village of Gurney and um, be able to do so well without uh, having to skimp and save uh, and especially again for the seniors. So um, thanks for everybody doing that. Uh, so on to item number three, approval of ordinance 2023. 25. Uh, amending the Village of Gurney Financial Policies and Procedures Manual Fund Balance Policy. Pat. Sure. So this was also talked about throughout the budget process. Historically, we've had a fund balance policy of 35% of the general fund's budget expenditures. Brian did uh, some research, looked at comparable communities as far as best practices and is recommending that we take that up to between 60 and 65%. Uh, anything over 65%, the village board could consider to use that for capital improvements. If we drop below 60%, um, that triggers reporting requirements uh, from staff to the village board as well as a plan uh, to get us back up above that 60%. So he included a red line of the policy in your packet. Um, it's actually only a couple sentences uh, change. But again, this is something we've talked about I mean, more accurately reflects our needs as far as fund balance, given that we don't have a property tax in place and rely heavily on um, elastic uh, revenue sources. Any discussion or questions on this one? There being none, any motions? So moved. Motion Second. by Trustee uh, O'Brien. Second by Trustee Thorsonson. Roll call, please. Ross. Aye. Garner. Aye. O'Brien. Aye. Thomas. Aye. Thorsonson. Yes. Bye-bye. Motion passes. So, um, item number four, approval of ordinance 2023-26. Authorizing the transfer of funds from the general fund to the capital improvement fund, the water and sewer capital improvement fund, and health insurance fund. Pat? Uh, sure. So also talked about multiple times throughout the budget process. There is some projected surplus uh, from fiscal year 2021-22. Um, as we discussed, staff has recommended to take $4.5 million of this, transfer $2 million to the capital improvement fund, uh, two million to the water and sewer uh, improvement capital improvement fund, and then five hundred thousand dollars to the health insurance fund. So this will allow us to continue on with aggressive capital programs in the future, and then also um, provide some seed money for the health insurance fund, which is a new fund that was created um, last year. So it's been uh, included in the budget, as Brian mentioned during the public hearing, and is now ready for your consideration. Is there a motion? So moved. Motion Second. by Trustee Ross, second by Trustee Garner. Roll call, please. Ross. Aye. Garner. Aye. O'Brien. Aye. Thomas. Aye. Thorstenson. Yes. Bye-bye. Motion carries. Item number five, approval resolution 2023. 03. Committing local funds in conjunction with Rebuild Illinois bond funds. Pat? Sure. So you remember when we spend uh, MFT funds, we have to pass a resolution uh, that we provide to the state of Illinois that indicates 
the dollar amount of MFT funds we're going to spend. Um, this is the same thing. So this is rebuild Illinois funds. Um, you remember that was the state's uh, capital bill. They passed along funding um, to localities based on population. Uh, the village received a little over $2 million over that time period. Uh, the program did expire at the end of 22-23, so we've received all the money that we're going to get um, as part of the uh, 2023 reconstruction program. Uh, staff is recommending to use a million dollars of the rebuild funds to support that program, so this resolution indicates that to the state of Illinois. So with reference to the resolution without the motion? Uh, just to approve the resolution. Okay. Uh, so um, with reference to approving the resolution, we'll take a roll call vote, please. Uh, you want to do the motion? You got to yeah. 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 oh, do the motion, too. Motion. Okay. Same process. Right. Motion. Sorry. motion by Trustee Thorstenson. <clears throat> second by Trustee O'Brien. Uh, roll call, please. Garner. Aye. I'm sorry. Ross. Aye. Now Garner. Aye. O'Brien. Aye. Palmas. Aye. Thorstenson. Yes. Bye bye. So resolved. Approval of ordinance or approval of engineering division recommendation to award the 2023 street maintenance resurfacing program to the low bidder J. Ace Johnson paving at a cost of four million four hundred ninety seven thousand dollars. Pat. Sure. So as is uh, typical after we approve the budget, there's a slew of purchases that the village board or the staff brings forward to the village board for consideration to get these programs rolling. Um, the first one here is the street maintenance uh, program. We budgeted 7.9 million for transportation improvements, uh, includes six miles of street resurfacing. Uh, some of the areas uh, included this year, a few of them, Waveland Avenue, Prescott Lane, Old Walnut Circle, Greystone Drive, Delaware Avenue, as well as all the roads in Spinney Run. The breakdown of these uh, roadways, you know we do a condition assessment um, every other year. Uh, that helps drive the program as far as where improvements need to be made. When you look at the length of the roads that we have uh, recommended this year for uh, reconstru or for resurfacing, 64.7% are rated failed, 30.3% poor, and then 5% fair. So addressing a big chunk of, of roadways that need to be um, addressed. Uh, Engineering Division opened bids on April 3rd, three bids. They range from 4.497 million to 4.794 million. Jay Johnson was a low bidder. Uh, we've used them in the past 2016, 18, and 2020 for the contracts. Um, they do a good job, so staff is recommending to move forward with them as a low bidder for the 2023 program. Is there a motion? So move. Motion by Trustee Garner, second by Trustee Ross. Roll call, please. Ross. Garner. Aye. O'Brien. Aye. Balmas. Aye. Thorstenson. Yes. Bye-bye. A motion carries. Approval of engineering division recommendation <laughs> to award the 2023 water main replacement program to Capanella and Sons, uh, Inc. at a cost of $3,424,225.60. Pat? Sure. So a memo from our village engineer, Nick Leach, on this. I'll also discuss this a little bit during the public hearing uh, earlier in the night. We had 2.4 million in the budget for both projects. The engineer's estimate uh, was uh, 2.7 million, which we received that number after the budget was put together. Um, so that timing we will address going forward. Uh, we had six different companies pick up the bid packages, but only one bid. Um, following that, again, we called around, talked to both contractors and communities. Contractors stated that they had a full plate and our projects have time constraints um, that uh, need to be met. So given those two factors, um, reduce uh, the amount of contractors bidding on it. When we called other communities, we had surrounding communities that also only received one bidder and the bids came over what they had in budget or had in their budgets as well. We compared some unit costs to make sure that we weren't um, getting gouged on per unit pricing um, compared to what other communities received and we were not. So Capanel and Son uh, was the only bidder on that. And we do have some money in the budget related to some um, cost sharing uh, with the county that we don't think those projects are going to move. One of them for sure isn't going to move forward this next fiscal year. So we're proposing to take some of that funding and push that towards the water main replacement. And then um, as we discussed about in the public hearing, amending the budget to add $500,000 on the water and sewer capital side to get these projects taken care of. So staff discussed whether it made sense to delay one or both of the projects or try to break them up. And at the end of the day, um, obviously they'll plan 
uh, road water main, you've got the school, police department, village hall, library, um, so multiple public facilities on that. Um, and that main has been a problem, so it didn't make sense to delay that. And then over with the Waveland and Granville, um, again, lots of breaks out there, uh, impacts to residents' houses. Also have uh, that geared up for some repaving over there as well. So it didn't make sense to delay that project. So at the end of the day, um, with some of this funding that's geared toward uh, the county projects that we don't think will happen in 23, 24, and then amending the budget, we're able to move forward with these. I think it's also important to remember that typically not all the funding is spent in the water and sewer fund and on the capital side. So despite amending the budget by $500,000, we think we'll make some of that up before we reach in the end of the year. So uh, everybody is aware of Camp and Allen Sons, work for the village um, on numerous projects, always do a good job. So staff is recommending to move forward with them to get these projects taken care of this fiscal year. Any questions or comments? Make a motion, motion. to approve. Second. Motion by Trustee Baumas, second by Trustee Thorstenson. <coughs> Roll call, please. Ross. Aye. Garner. Aye. O'Brien. Aye. Baumas. Aye. Thorstenson. Yes. Bye-bye. Motion carries. Uh, item number eight, approval of Public Works Department recommendation to award the 2023 concrete sidewalk, sidewalk replacement program to Schroeder and Schroeder at a cost not to exceed $185,000. Joint bid consortium program pricing. Pat? Yeah, so we worked with uh, Arlington Heights, Mount Prospect, Lincolnshire, Wheeling, and Wakanda to bid out our sidewalk uh, replacement program this year. Uh, Schroeder and Schroeder was the low bidder on that uh, at an amount not to exceed $185,000 for the amount of work that the village has. They have done our, con our concrete sidewalk program for the last uh, three years, or 2019, 21, and 22. Always done a good job by teaming up with these uh, other municipalities we're able to take uh, advantage of economies of scale, which was reflected in some of the pricing. Um, and there is appropriate funding in the budget, so we're recommending to move forward again with Schroeder and Schroeder to cost not to exceed 185000 to address sidewalks. Right. Is there a motion? So moved. moved. Second. Motion by Trustee Balma, second by Trustee Garner. Roll call, please. Ross. Aye. Garner. Aye. O'Brien. Aye. Balmas. Aye. Thorstenson. Yes. Bye-bye. Motion carries. Uh, item nine, approval of fire department request to waive the formal bidding requirement and purchase one 2023 Chevrolet Tahoe for wheel drive Tahoe PPV from Carl emergency vehicles at the cost of $42,996 fire department unit, unit 1399. Pat? Sure. So this is identical to a request that was before you about a month ago for the, uh, deputy chief vehicle, the fire department. We're unable to find, uh, Tahoe PPVs uh, through the state contract. Our fleet administrator found Carl emergency vehicles out in Des Moines. We have purchased some Tahoes from them. So we reached out to them again and they do, or they are able to provide um, another Tahoe to the fire department uh, within the next couple months. Same price as the last one, 42,996. It's replaced in a 2012 Ford Expedition. Uh, that car has over 91,000 miles on it and numerous mechanical issues. So uh, the chief, uh, plans out his vehicle replacement, um, so this is on schedule uh, with what he had uh, planned out as far as the needs in the department, um, and there is the appropriate funding in the budget. So again, this is getting an order in because vehicles <coughs> continue to get, to get difficult, are more and more difficult to source. Is there a motion to approve? So I'll move. Second by Trustee Ross, second by Trustee Garner. Roll call, please. Ross. Aye. Garner. Aye. O'Brien. Aye. Balmas. Aye. Thorstenson. Yes. Bye-bye. Motion carries. Item 10, approval of Public Works Department request to request, request to waive the formal uh, bidding requirement and purchase 2024 Chevrolet Crew Cab 2500 pickup and 2023 Chevrolet Colorado Crew Cab pickup from Ray Chevrolet Fox Lake at a total cost of $92,687. Public Works Units 20, 278 and 680. Pat. So this is two pickup trucks that Public Works had in their budget. Uh, one vehicle is a 2008 Ford F-250, 95,000 miles on it, 15 years old. Uh, the fleet administrator, uh, through our uh, com computerized fleet analysis system, is able to run a vehicle replacement score. Um, anything over, let's see here, 28 is considered uh, condition four, which suggests immediate consideration for replacement. So the first vehicle is a 38.73. Uh, second vehicle is a 2015 Colorado, 81,000 miles on it. 
and that's at 28.75, which is a condition three, which qualifies for replacement. Um, again, as we've talked about multiple times, sourcing these vehicles is difficult. We've worked with Ray Chevrolet multiple times in the past. We've got a relationship established with them. Fleet administrator called them. They are able to secure these vehicles with about a 14 week lead time, um, which in today's day and age is actually pretty reasonable. Uh, we do receive government pricing. I should have mentioned that on the Tahoe previously as well. So even though we're um, asking to waive the formal uh, bidding requirement, in these instances, there's government pricing on these vehicles, which the dealerships still pass along to us. So we are um, still receiving that benefit as a local government. So is there a motion? So moved. Motion by Trustee O'Brien, second by Trustee Thorstenson. <clears throat> Roll call, please. Ross. Garner. Aye. O'Brien. Aye. Balmas. Aye. Bye-bye. <coughs> <Perfect. coughs> All right. Motion carries. Um, item 11, approval of Public Works Department request to waive the formal bidding requirement and purchase 2023 factory CAD GTX uh, version 2 floor scrubber machine from factory cleaning equipment at a cost of $22,090. Public units, uh, Public Works Unit 20, 20, or 226. Pat? Sure. So think of like a mini Zamboni that scrubs the, the Public Works floor because that's what this is. The current unit is a 2011, um, and again, with the trucks going in and out of the Public Works main garage constantly, um, with salt on the vehicle sometimes, it's important to keep that floor clean um, as much as possible to reduce the corrosion uh, that occurs on the concrete. Also, uh, with the Village Board approving uh, the Public Works Department to purchase uh, coating for the floor up there, it's even more important that when the floor is scrubbed, it is cleaned off to get that abrasive material um, and chemicals off the floor. So the, the fleet administrator started making calls uh, to try to find a comparable unit. In some instances, he found lead times to be up to two years and units to be double, or the, the unit cost to be double um, what we were able to secure from factory cleaning equipment. So they're down in Aurora, they've got a machine that meets our needs, um, and we're recommending uh, approval to purchase. Again, the funds are included in the budget. Is there a motion? So no moved. Motion by Trustee Thorsonson. Uh, second by Trustee Balmas. Roll call, please. Ross. Aye. Garner. Aye. O'Brien. Aye. Balmas. Aye. Thorstenson. Yes. Bye-bye. Motion carries. Approval of Public Works Department request to waive the formal bidding requirement and purchase six 18,500-pound Sturtle Coney mobile column lifts and one Traverse cross beam from USA lifts at a cost of $94,345.71. Pat. Sure, uh, so this is all also included in the budget. So just as a reminder, uh, vehicle maintenance has six bays and within those six bays, you've got three lifts. The lifts vary in size um, based on the, or vary in size and therefore handle different size vehicles. The original building was from 2000s, uh, early 2000s. So obviously the equipment that we're using now is different than what it was uh, 23 years ago. So the plaza the trucks have gotten bigger, the wings have gotten bigger. So they run into issues at the Public Works Department as far as fitting these newer vehicles in the bays and being able to work on them safely. So the mobile lifts are something that we have researched over the years, as well as trying to modify the Public Works garage itself. Um, when you look at it from a financial perspective, the mobile lifts are much cheaper than starting to mess with the structure of the building. Um, for those that have been around long enough, you may remember one year at Gurney Days, they had the lift set up on the main floor with the vector up on it. Um, and kids running around underneath there. <laughs> so uh, those same lifts um, reached a point where it's feasible uh, from a budget perspective and then also needed just from a safety perspective with the size of the vehicles that, that we have now. So these lifts are mobile, so they can be used in vehicle maintenance, they could be moved down on the shop floor, they could be taken to an offsite location if need be. Um, they're large enough to handle all the equipment that we have, they'll lift a fully loaded um, tandem axle uh, public works salt truck in the air. Um, currently when we pull these trucks in, before they pull them in, they have to take the wings off um, to get them in there and have enough room to maneuver around. So this will um, reduce the need um, to do that. And then also, like I said, create a, a safer working environment for the mechanics. So um, demoed a couple different units from different dealers. Um, this vendor, uh, which is, or these units from USA Lifts, which is down in uh, Bloomington, um, were the preferred units uh, 
based off of the demos from Public Works. And like I said, this is something that they've been focusing on and, and demoing over the last probably six or seven years. Um, so I've done a lot of research on it. Um, and the funding's been included in the budget. So staff is recommending to move forward uh, to get this order in. Is there a motion? I'll move. Second. Motion by Trustee Balmas. Is there a second? Second. Oh, Trustee O'Brien. Sorry, I didn't hear you. Uh, roll call, please. Ross. Aye. Garner. Aye. O'Brien. Aye. Balmas. Aye. Thorsonson. Yes. Bye bye. Motion carries. Item 13, approval of Public Works Department request to waive the formal bidding requirements and purchase a 275 kilowatt Cummins towable uh, generator with trailer from Midwest Power Industry Inc. at a cost of $191,440. Expense eligible for $63,813.33. Reimbursement from the NL CCETSB. Ken. Sure. So our current mobile generator is from 1972. Uh, which has been a challenge as far as finding parts to keep it going. Uh, it also has issues with the gas tank. If the gas tank's integrated into the frame and it leaks, so we can only fill it up so far. Uh, we use this uh, piece of equipment at sanitary lift stations that don't have uh, permanent standby generators, uh, as well as a public works facility when we have generator issues there. So as we looked at um, standby power needs, both with the water and sewer system as well as facilities, we started talking to the police department about the communication center. Um, obviously, we do not want that uh, facility to go down. We have uh, multiple redundancies in place right now. Um, but again, to provide some more reassurance and to make sure that we have a piece of equipment that would serve that facility as well as public works current, current needs. Uh, they sized down the generator, so 275 kilowatt is what we need. Uh, this was something that was included in this current year's budget. Uh, looking to split it three ways between police department, public works, and then the jet speed. So as the mayor read, uh, the total cost is a little over 191. We'll re be receiving $63,000 back from the jet speed. Uh, received uh, multiple bids or multiple reached out to multiple uh, vendors to receive bids. Um, Midwest Power, someone that we've worked with in the past. Uh, the generator again. It, meets our needs and is replacing a unit that's 50 years old. Probably gonna hang on to that 50 year old unit for a while. I'm um, gonna continue to limp it along, but at some point in time it's gonna break and we're not gonna be able to find parts to, to fix it. So if the power goes out at a sanitary sewer lift station, we don't want those calls if there's not a generator there to take care of that problem, so. Is there a motion? So move. Second. Motion by Trustee Garner, second by Trustee Thorsonson. Roll call, please. Ross. Aye. Garner? Aye. O'Brien? Aye. Balmas? Aye. Thorstenson? Yes. Bye-bye. Motion carries. Uh, item 14, approval of Public Works Department request to waive the formal bidding requirement and purchase 3,850 LTEM Orion endpoints and 3,080 Orion outdoor enclosures from Midwest Meter, Inc. at a cost of $520,997.40. Okay. Sure. So as you know, Public Works Department has been uh, working over the past couple of years to replace the uh, meter reading equipment outside of homes and businesses. Uh, we give regular status updates as far as the progress that they've made. Um, March 2021, uh, the Village Board, after staff's recommendation, decided to move forward with the Badger Meter Orions um, as those meter reading units. So uh, we've made uh, some purchases. Uh, over the last couple years in bulk. So we purchased 3,000 units in April 2021, another 27,500 in April 2022. Uh, originally, uh, Public Works had planned this out to be a four-year change-out program. They've made better progress than they expected and uh, are looking to reduce that to three years. So this uh, last 3,850 is what they need to complete the program. To date, they've replaced about 5,800 readers, so probably a little bit more. Um, since the, I put my notes together. But again, the, this will get us uh, the remaining units we need, finish the program a year ahead of schedule. And then the next big ticket item will be discussing the actual water meters themselves, but that's for a different meeting. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Motion by Trustee Ross, second by Trustee O'Brien. Roll call, please. Ross. Aye. Garner. Aye. O'Brien. Aye. Thomas. Aye. Thorsonson. Yes. Five. Motion carries. Good job, Heather, on the speed of those being put in. 
even though it costs us money, it's being spent to make sure it happens quickly, right? So thank you. Uh, on to the last item is public comment. Anybody that would like to make a public comment, if you'd like to step up to the microphone and state your name, we will listen. Um, Shelley Palmer, 6304 Dural Drive. Um, yes, Wentworth residents have been fighting tooth and nail to not allow cases to be built in our neighborhood, and we lost the fight. Now we are faced with the village allowing beer and wine sales in our community literally in our backyard. The Illinois Com Liquor Commission wrote, no license shall be issued within 100 feet of any church, school, except colleges and universities, hospital, home for the aged, indigent person or veterans, or any military or naval station. The 100 feet is to be measured from property line to property line in all cases, except that of a church. Wentworth subdivision is zero feet from the proposed cases and Bickford Senior Living is 66 feet. Mayor Hood said that in deciding whether to allow alcohol sales in Gurnee, he tried to balance business, property owners, residents' interests, and sometimes that can be difficult. I have no doubt it's a difficult task. However, this balancing act should take into account residents. Beer and wine is gonna be sold in Gurnee. Please don't allow these sales in our backyard or any backyard that could potentially have the misfortune of a gas station being on it. Exceptions are made for the petitioners, and it only seems fair that exceptions be made for the residents. Also according to Gurney's Municipal Code, Section 6-17, no license required by this chapter shall be issued if the location is determined to be detrimental to the general character of the surrounding neighborhood and the projected impact of the premises upon the surrounding neighborhood of the village as a whole would be considered detrimental. A gas station convenience store is detrimental to the general character of a residential neighborhood. Can you honestly say you'd be happy about or proud of the fact you'd be living with the Casey's in your backyard? Close your eyes and look at it from an outsider's point of view. This is the image Gurney will be projecting for all to see and for years to come. The sale of beer and wine further adds to the negative impact of alcohol sales. This negative impact is based on crime statistics for gas stations provided by the Gurney Police Department, as well as research done by the University of Wisconsin of alcohol density on both health and safety of a community. I'm proposing the following amendment to the newly enacted liquor ordinance. No license shall be issued within 100 feet of any church, school, except colleges and university, home for the aged, indigent person or veterans, or any military or naval station or residential neighborhood in the village of Gurney. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody, like to make, anybody else would like to make a statement? Mr. Owens? You're right. <laughs> Good evening. Keith Owens, 6464 Doral Drive. Uh, following up on what my neighbor said, um, at the last meeting when the uh, ordinance was approved, during the part of the conversation, Trustee Ross indicated a concern that no matter how many locks or, or card readers you have, if somebody comes in with a gun, they're going to, you know, that, that a crime's going to happen. And it's, her concern was, selling alcohol in those locations might present a chance for increased crime. Um, at that time, the mayor responded, I quote here, I don't know if there has been a tie between higher crime and beer and wine sales. I don't know that that is the case. Okay, um, so g taking aside, setting aside the fact that I've, in previous meetings I've presented information to the board, both verbally and in writing, about the tie between alcohol density and crime. I, I've done a pretty deep dive into the literature, and you're right, there is no research that, that indicates the propensity of increase for crime and the sale, sale of beer and wine. There's also no research that indicates a propensity of increase of crime for a happy hour or for selling martinis. That's not how they classify it, okay? There are some officers here today. I'm sure when they pull somebody over suspected for DUI, 
the, the, the driver says, I've only had a couple beers or I've only caught a couple glasses of wine, they say, oh, that's okay, you can go. So let's just face facts. The, 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 the standard is alcohol, not beer and wine. So I presented a lot of information to this, this board in writing before. And by the way, thanks to Pat for not only passing that on, but also yeah, thanks. pursuing me to my, not pursuing, but coming out to my car and saying, Keith, you know, there's a better way to do this. You don't have to type it all in so that we can all read it. So thank you once again, Pat. So just based on the information that um, Shelley put in, I'll remind you that I sent you this information. And there is a strong scientific evidence that increased alcohol outlet density increases rate of alcohol consumption, violent crime, and underage drinking. Okay. And as part of that University of Wisconsin study, rates of alcohol consumption and violent crimes and assaults and robberies increase as alcohol outlet density increases. Greater alcohol outlet, outlet density is associated with higher rates of intimate partner violence and child abuse. And this uh, research that I provided to you has about 30 different articles that you could uh, delve into. I noticed when the present presentation was made um, by Ellen, did a very great job of, of breaking down how gas stations make their money or don't make their money and how you know, the alcohol sales contribute to that or, or the lack of is a detriment to that. So that was a lot of research. My concern at that time, as I expressed and, and I re-express it today, is there has not been enough research done by the, not only the business advocates, but the, the public advocates in terms of the impact that this is going to have on communities. And I believe that you are the organization that has that charge in terms of the overall community. At the last meeting, a comment was made to one of our residents that to the effect that, well, if this wasn't being built in your backyard, you wouldn't be concerned. Well, at one level, that's right. If it wasn't being built in our backyard, we probably wouldn't even know about it. Although we've tried to raise that, that, that level of interest in the community. But our backyard is only 72 homes and about 150 people. And not, not all 150 people signed our petitions, but over 600 people did. So this is not just a backyard interest in, for the community. And I hope you take that into consideration when license applications come. It's not just that we're against Casey's or against Casey's selling alcohol. I think it's kind of unfortunate that somebody could think that we're only concerned because it's in our backyard and that we're not capable of having concerns beyond our community. The fact that you're sitting up there today demonstrates that you do have concerns beyond your own local community. And I hope you would ascribe that same level of concern to us as well. Now, another bit of research done by the clinical and experimental research on alcoholism stated this in this conclusion. And I'm going to leave all these with the clerk afterwards so that if you are not aware, you can become aware. The conclusion, access to outlets that allow for off-site consumption. Notice the distinction is not beer or wine or, or, or hard liquors. But the distinction here is whether you can buy the alcohol and consume it there or whether you can carry it out. <clears throat> Access to out, out, outlets that allow for off-site consumption had a greater association with violent crime than, outlaws, than outlets with only permit on on-site consumption. The lack of effective measures to keep order in and around off-premise outlets could affect, could attract, excuse me, or multiply violent crime, okay? So these sites can attract crime, and they can act as a multiplier. Now, I'm sure there's some statistics that law enforcement has at, at their disposal, if not locally, at least on a statewide level, that could, could back that up. I've done my own research based on the FOIA information that the, the, uh, the police department was nice enough to, um, to provide to me that there is a, a tremendous magnifier effect uh, in for the one gas station that is close to a residential neighborhood, the uh, Speedway on East Grand Avenue. And that's, that, that's about as close as that the new uh, Casey's is going to be to us. And that's without alcohol. So when you're considering whether you're going to grant a license to Casey's or any, any facility in Gurney, take that into consideration. Here's how cities can reduce violent crime by regulating alcohol sales. 
This is a research article. It is, a, and it quotes here, it is a long established in public health research that more alcohol is associated with a greater likelihood of violence. All right. This applies on the community level as well. Multiple studies have found that more places to buy alcohol in a neighborhood are connected to higher violent crime rates. So not only is this the, the idea of density increases the propensity for violence, but research also supports that this is a, exacerbated by situations where alcohol can be purchased and then carried out as opposed to consumed on the premises. There's an article here, Preventing Violence in American Cities with Safer Alcohol Sales. There's 43 research articles quoted here, some of which speak directly to this issue. I'm not going to bore you with all that, but I'm going to provide this to anyone who wants to be, uh, become aware of that. And the, the association between alcohol density establishments and violent crimes within urban neighborhoods, results of this study combined with earlier findings provide more evidence that community leaders should be cautious about increasing the density of alcohol establishments within their neighborhoods. Now, based on the debate that occurred here at the last uh, public meeting, I know that is a concern. And I know there is a, a, a need to weigh the economic benefits versus public safety and public health. But when, the, when these organizations come before you and requesting a license, I'm not 100% sure, sure what the process is. But for example, I believe Casey's is probably going to come before the board requesting a license before they actually pursue, go ahead and build as part of their permitting process. Now the application will come to the village. Pat will make sure that the police department gets a copy and they'll do their background checks, okay? Which, I'm under, which we were told takes about all of about three days. There's a financial aspect to it as well, and of course Casey's is going to pass that. And then of course there's going to be, do they meet the code in terms of uh, the freezer space and the locking mechanism and, and the card reading and things as well, okay? At some point in that process, the liquor commissioner, your mayor, is going to decide whether they meet the requirements of the code. And then that will be brought before the council and you will have a chance to vote on that. When you do vote on that, I hope you understand about all the possible and negative impacts to the community, not just, not just our neighborhood, but the entire community. Now the last meeting, there was a lot of discussion about, well, if we don't, if we don't, if we put this in language in the ordinances and then somebody comes and meets the requirements and we grant a license and then somebody comes and meets the requirements and we don't grant a license, are we open for, are we liable for, uh, you know, being sued? When I took my one business course, business law course in college, my professor said, all you need to sue is $10 and a typewriter. Now it's probably $50 and access to the internet. <clears throat> you have an opportunity and you still have an opportunity before anybody makes an application, I'm, I'm assuming that they haven't already for, under this ordinance, to put language in that ordinance that gives you a subjective, excuse me, an objective measure. Shelley outlined to that to you right before this. It's in the State Liquor Commission, Control Commission handbook. It's not a law, but it's, it's guidelines to communities. Now that doesn't address the issues surrounding the Speedway Station near, near um, Gurney Mills, but when you take a look at some of the crime statistics and things associated with that, maybe you can make a, a, a good uh, um, case for that as well. The existing ordinance that talks about no detriment to the public health and safety that Shelley outlined that's in your own rules is subjective. And I, I know the lawyers, you know, when you ask a lawyer what's possible, the answer is going to be, well, just about anything's possible. And, you're, and Brian was trying to do the best that he could to explain that, you know, this may or may not happen. Why put yourself in that position? Add language to the existing ordinance, whether it's within the class that you just approved or the overall ordinances that talks about no establishment going forward will be allowed to be 
to have a license if they're within 100 feet of these various institutions or your neighborhoods. Something that's measurable, that's, tan that's, uh, that's tangible, okay? Because otherwise you're gonna have to go back to what you already have in the, the spirit of your <coughs> ordinances, which is we're gonna try to do this so that it's not gonna hurt the community. But if somebody comes back to you and says, well, that's a subjective thing and we're gonna sue you, you're gonna be in a tough position, all right? Now, you have two lawyers in, in your organization. And in my experience, I've, 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 I've dealt with a lot of lawyers with financial information and investor relations and communications. That's my background in communications, as you can tell. And I've dealt with a lot of lawyers, and the most effective lawyers I've had are, aren't ones that told me what I can't do, they're ones that told me what I can do. So I hope that you will withdraw on these resources, plus your staff, and come up with something that you can do that can put some objective criteria in the ordinances that will bring the balance back between business development and the health, safety, and welfare of the community. I thank you very much once again for your time and consideration and all the hard work you do to make Gurney a great place to live. I hope you continue to do that in the future. Thanks, Mr. Owens. Anybody else that'd like to make a public comment? There being none, uh, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Motion by Trustee Balma, second by Trustee Garner. All in favor say aye. 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 We're adjourned. Thanks. David.